Okay, so I guess I'm going to start with one question, which is perhaps a philosophical question about the notion of play itself, since it is the, the major theme of the festival and also of our event today. Uh, usually when we used to think about play, we used to think about play as something we do for no purpose. We play to have fun, we play to uh, fight boredom, uh, we play for no reason sometimes. But it seems to me that what gamification is doing is that it's making all forms of play almost as something with a purpose. So play is becoming something with like a, a means to an end as opposed to a means without end uh, in itself. So it's becoming much more teleological. So I guess my question would be to perhaps all of you is, what is the danger of turning play into a serious game through gamification? Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't got a, f a formed answer, but I was just thinking um, that um, I have a, a very young daughter, and uh, observing her play is very clear to me that play is, in fact, always does have a purpose, and the mm -hmm. purpose is to learn uh, and to develop and to find ways of engaging with the world, uh, to kind of cope with challenging situations. So play and playful activity is always um, useful in some way. However, I think what gamification does is it make it um, quantifiable. Mm -hmm. So it makes it useful in a quantifiable way. And I think for me the main question here is the question that Paolo um, raised um, uh, in relation to quantifiable versus um, qualitative um, uh, play or, or change. Um, so I think m my concern is when we start quantifying uh, play and making it useful in ways that have to do with productivity and with consumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, if yeah, I can add quickly gonna... one thing, I mean, the, the debates that uh, gamification embrace in, in game studies, for example, in the study yeah. of the medium of the video game, are, are precisely that uh, gamification maybe has mm. really nothing to do with games at all. Mm. Uh, mm. The interpretation that text on gamification uh, give on, of the text on game design, it, it's actually a very superficial mm. uh, reinterpretation and take only a very few and limited techniques such as uh, leader, leaderboards, badges, scores, etc. So many are arguing and have been arguing that gamification, it, actually it's, it's, there is no gaming in gamification. Mm. Uh, and if I can add, I also wonder whether we should, whether there is a game that is not serious, you know, mm. because uh, that's so often when um, people talk about serious game or serious gaming, they talk about uh, using gaming, for example, for health purposes. But, you know, gamers are often serious. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that the seriousness is part of the dual gaming practice. So, and another thing that I just throw it up out there is whether we want to make a difference between um, game and play. Mm -hmm. um, and, you mm -hmm. know, what is, whether, I mean, what is the role, what is the meaning mm -hmm. of such a difference? But, I mean, so I would, for discussion. Yeah, so I would perhaps think that maybe reclaiming, like the form of resistance in this context would be to reclaim the playfulness of play mm -hmm. rather than to subscribe to uh, the serious forms of play that play has to be done in order to learn or to, to learn new skills or to better our performance. Maybe we can just play for the sake of playing and that would be the form of resistance. And Giorgio Agamemnon talks about it in, in other contexts as well. I, there is a hand there in relation to this question. Absolutely. Okay, good. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, sorry, yes. There is a microphone coming towards you. Thank you very much. So a point to back up what Dr. Maria, Dr. Maria was saying. Um, I, I saw an article about an uh, example of gamification in China, uh, a life game that was being designed and is... I understand in future to become mandatory for all Chinese citizens where um, you get points added or taken away for your behaviours. For example, buying things that are appropriate for what's seen patriotic and points docked for you know, not seeing your relatives or buying Japanese products. And there will be points deducted not just for your behaviour but the behaviour of your countrymen. So if you were to um, interact with other people who were deemed unpatriotic, it would bring your score down too. And I was wondering if you'd heard of that or had any thoughts about how, you know, how dangerous gamification could become when governments are getting in on the act? 
Uh, I hadn't thought of that, but um, uh, thank you very much for bringing it to our attention. Um, it does sound a very, very scary a prospect, and um, I think uh, it, it kind of it does take me back to um, Abdi Hajj's question as well. Why don't we just play? Can't we just reclaim play rather than seek to find ways to resist gamification? Well, we can, and uh, artists do, and people do. Um, but at the same time, we do, we do live within specific um, social contexts and um, technological contexts. And uh, we do need ways of resistance as well when actually just, uh, just, just playing isn't possible because of things like that. Hmm. And surely, and one, uh, one extra thing about this game is that it, it, the idea is that it would affect whether you can get certain loans mm. and it would affect what you're allowed to do in China. And this is something that I understand is being trialled at the moment with the idea that down the line it will be mandatory for all citizens. Yeah, if I, if I can add one thing about this story. I mean, I've, I've read m many articles about this, this, this story. Um, it, I will be cautious. I'm not totally sure how, how exactly it works. It might be that it works exact, exactly as we are told. But in this story that we have been receiving in many uh, mainstream um, news media about this uh, Chinese app that tracks everything that we do and the data is collected by the government, etc., etc. I think it's interesting as a, as, a, as a narrative, as a dystopian narrative, that uh, I think it's also interesting that we somehow project these dystopian narratives in, in this uh, Far East. Uh, it used to be Japan very often, our dystopian narratives about technologies, they're almost always already <coughs> happening in Japan, right? Um, now there is the story of the Chinese app, which is circulating. Um, I think what's interesting is that we have this nightmare that, uh, that we are ready not to be probably our reality right now, but very close to becoming so. We kind of project it to, mm -hmm. to, to this Chinese environment. Uh, and, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that we are kind of creating, that we are becoming fascinated about this, this story. Um, then how, how true it is, I'm not totally sure, but it might be. I'm, I'm, I haven't, it's difficult actually to, to, to get like facts about this, mm. this app. There's a hand here and then, uh, yeah, this lady over here, thanks. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering if there's, a, anyway, you talked a lot about uh, gamification, um, but I noticed that you um, don't really make much of a distinction between games and tracking devices, actually. They're two quite fundamentally different things. For instance, uh, Pokemon Go is kind of, in a sense, warping your reality, um, even though it is very engaging in real life and does track you, uh, whereas there are devices like uh, Nike devices and also weight loss devices that are far more simplified, still gamified in some sense um, because it involves a mobile phone most of the time, um, but it's not a game as such. And do you distinguish between those two things? Yeah, uh, the, the confusion is actually in the, in the marketing itself of these products because it's, uh, they're very often presented as games. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, there are lots of debates. So if, uh, is like Nike Fuel really a game? Probably it's not because there is no and in the game. There is no, uh, uh, there is not a final goal, really. Uh, there is no win way to win at this game. Um, but it is uh, presented through this uh, larger kind of umbrella of, the, of gamification and, and the, the use of uh, uh, games for self-improvement and so on. Uh, but yeah, there is a lot of, it's this kind of broadening of the definition of what games are that is happening here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we can still kind of make the distinction, of course. Uh, sorry, to just, just away, yeah. but, I mean, because I think there is a fear of kind of becoming afraid, sorry. Um, there is a fear of kind of um, making it more scary than it is, because tracking devices are, anyway, providing that you own that data and nobody else gets it, you know, you are the master of that data and you can do with it what you like. Whereas, um, you know, games are far more immersive and, you know, they're very, very different things and we can become very afraid of using any kind of device to help us mm -hmm. and any gamification becomes bad in a way, but it's, it's not. Actually, the data is not yours. It belongs yeah. to the company. Fitbit used to charge $50 a year to make you access your own data. They've changed the policy recently uh, after a lot of backlash. But anyway, yeah, I'm sure there are different apps, sure. absolutely. I mean, for instance, myself, I'm, a, I'm an avid Weight Watcher, mm -hmm. <laughs> and nobody has access to what I eat um, just because I write it in my diary and they 
as far as I understand, they don't have that information because it's just all pub, you know, private. Um, but there is, yeah. isn't that quite important to kind of distinguish? Mm -hmm. That's my sure. point, anyway. Uh, thank you. Can, if, I, if I can just say Sorry. something, I, I do think it is important. Uh, there are some similarities, and what I was trying to point out is that, yeah, there are some similarities in the way um, there is, in, in both cases, a, an intention to uh, change people's behavior through, um, yeah, to, to, to change people's behavior towards like healthier lifestyles. But at the same time, it's done in a very different way, and I think it is important to distinguish it. Although, uh, and that's what I say when I was saying like games and numbers, and also the, the rhetoric and the images that I use, the metaphors, are really different. Um, however, I, I found it interesting when you showed um, uh, Quantified Selfers video, mm -hmm. and one of them said um, they reward you with graphs. So you do mm -hmm. all this, all the, with all these self-tracking devices reward you with graphs. And in that moment, I was wondering, it's like, okay, probably the difference that I wanted to make is not that stark. So, but that, yeah, in general, mm -hmm. I think it's a good point. I'm going to ask Paolo a question before we move to the rest of uh, the audience questions. It's with regard to this notion of engagement. I mean, I really liked how he deconstructed engagement and you challenged this, um, this ideology of movement that is oftentimes part and parcel of the packaging uh, of self-tracking devices. So it's made me wonder, well, between marrying our devices and breaking up with them, is there any space in between? You talk about different, a different kind of engagement. So could you say a little bit more about... How would that look like to engage differently with our devices? Uh, well, maybe actually the, the example of uh, Karen is, a, is a, probably a different kind of engagement. Mm -hmm. right? So we are kind of engaging differently with a system that keeps track of, of our data. Um, so um, I think there can be many, many forms, many practices of, of uh, engaging differently or alternatively with with our gamified cells. Um, yeah, Daphne Dragona, that uh, Maria has been uh, quoting, she has been actually researching about this uh, idea of counter gamification. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be a counter form of, mm -hmm. of resistance. It can also be a way of playing around with, um, mm -hmm. with uh, quanti our quantified self. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Uh, OK, uh, I have Christina first, yes. Hi, um, thank you very much. This was really fascinating and stimulating. I have a broader question, and actually I'd like to hear all of your opinions. How do you make sense then of the rise of gamification in the current um, political climate? Mm -hmm. Would you see it as connected to processes of depoliticization, if you think that that's what's going on, or the rise of populism, and perhaps let's confine this to contemporary Western societies, because of course to talk about the world is a bit tricky in relation to politics. But I'm really intrigued, Maria briefly touched upon the social context, and the question that came to my mind when I was listening to your talks was really, well, why is it happening now? Um, so, yeah, if you could answer that question, that would be great. Um, I don't know why it's happening now. Um, I suppose, on, on the one hand, we can't have the technology <coughs> that can make it happen now, so it's partly... Um, you know, a, a technological mm. um, um, kind of capability. Um, on the other hand, um, I'm sure, you know, I talked about neoliberalism and I talked about um, kind of um, the drive uh, being profit very often mm. behind practices of gamification. Um, so obviously it's, it's, it's about capitalism and it's about um, um, corporations using, uh, trying to use um, um, kind of hedonistic uh, practices to make us do things that we wouldn't otherwise necessarily engage with because they're not that interesting, exciting or creative or, or, or anything else, such as buying um, things at the supermarket or, you know, um, flying. Um, so I think um, it, it's, it's a combination of the fact that technology allows us to do that and that the driver continues to be make, profit making and increasing returns. Um, so that, that, that's what I see as the driver behind mm. uh, that movement. At the same time, just wanted to say a couple of things. One, um, the, the, about the question before, the games versus gamification. And just to make clear, uh, Paolo uh, said, or, or Dihajad mm -hmm. as well, 
And that games and gamification are two different things. They're related, but they're different. Um, and gamification has been defined by Detterting as the use, use of game design elements in non-game contexts. Mm -hmm. So just to make this, to clarify this, so we're not talking about games um, per se when we're talking about gamification. And also, I, I am very um, um, cautious I'm sure not, none of us wants to set up binaries of good and bad, mm -hmm. and, and none of us wants to suggest that gamification is evil. Um, it's not just evil, um, you know, like everything, like all technology and all technological tools, it has the various um, mm -hmm. kind of possibilities to support and to perform kind of um, positive social functions as well as to harm, and there are thre threats to it. Um, so I just wanted to make clear about what I, I don't think the message you should take up going out from here is mm. gamification is bad, you know, because I don't think that's <laughs> yes. what we want to put forward. Mm. No, absolutely. And also, uh, when you think about the, the term itself, it's a performative word, get to gamify. It's, it's a to-do verb. It's an action verb. Uh, so we have the games, which is the object, and, and then you have the performative action as well. And, and therefore, gamification can be uh, sometimes enacted in a way that is uh, a form of resistance, it can be political, it can be just playful, or it can be utilitarian uh, and instrumentalist, as is the case of what's happening in the workplace, whereby uh, it is used in order to monitor productivity, uh, to control performance, and so on and so forth. Um, and to go back to the question of Christina, I think also we are living at a time uh, where we are more and more ruled by numbers and algorithms. I don't want to suggest that this is something completely new because we have always been ruled by numbers. If you think about um, like the, the 19th century and the rise of statistics, the census and everything, so each time there is um, a, a kind of... Uh, a form of knowledge that is emerging in the in the social, economic, and political sphere, there comes with it also uh, opportunities, challenges, modes of exploitation. And I think what, what's happening now is that we reach this point of algorithmic saturation, where everything is becoming amenable to uh, algorithmic regimes, to metric powers, uh, and to modes of, of control that are based on uh, quantification and metrics, whether we're talking about performance, whether we're talking about our bodies, uh, our subjectivities. So, so I think it boils down to the fact that algorithms are becoming much more, more and more um, pervasive and important in everyday life. Um, and politics is no exception. Um, and, yeah, if I can just say a very short thing with respect to uh, the healthcare domain, and I think um, if we look at uh, discourses um, in that field, uh, there is definitely a political push um, to to integrate this um, uh, these apps. Uh, mm -hmm. Self-tracking devices, um, games, but you know this, uh, uh, these tools within um, more traditional healthcare um, systems, and definitely the reason goes back to um, the 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 lack of resources and the need to uh, bring uh, patients to a more active role of prevention. So it goes back into that uh, in, into that rhetoric. Of um, of the of responsibilizing mm. uh, patients of their own health um, and um, yeah. in a way detracting responsibilities from the uh, from the state yeah. and the government and this is very strong. Um, if you look at uh, if, if you hear like uh, the uh, Mr. Hunt, the the Secretary of Health, uh, declarations on how um, he wants apps to be and self tracking devices to be included mm. uh, in uh, in uh, in traditional healthcare. Yeah, so Sorry. it's basically producing healthier bio-citizens with less costs. So basically this is the double aim of our pot political climate at the moment. Um, there was a hand uh, behind Christina, yes. Hi. Uh, hi all, Alessandro Gandini from Digital Humanities here. Uh, I have a question that kind of picks up from uh, your latest intervention, Tiaji, and builds up on the idea of engagement that Paolo brought uh, to us. Uh, because one of the things that I found fascinating in your unpacking of the idea of engagement, but you somewhat didn't touch upon, is that engagement is also linking into the idea of a promise. 
So engagement, when, when I engage, I, I probably talk by experience here, but when I engage with some, if you get engaged with someone, it's the sort of implicit promise of something, right? And, and I wonder, and this is open, of course, to all speakers here, I wonder whether the idea of engagement is actually a way to understand the success of these uh, quantification of things, either as tools, but also as processes. So we see gamification in a variety of processes and in the workplace you mentioned, but a variety of that. And whether that promise you know, of a healthy body, of a super controlled work, of hyper datification of things is actually what makes these things so, success so successful nowadays and so dystopian in our eyes as critical researchers that we all see surveillance and all, which is in play, of course, and, and, and I also mm -hmm. write and teach my students about that, but uh, maybe, maybe it's the promise, maybe it's mm -hmm. the illusion, maybe it's the fact that we can think about things that are hyper-controlled and therefore like naturally beautiful and naturally optimistic that makes us these things so attractive. Uh, absolutely, that's a, such a really interesting question. I mean, I like the notion of, of promise because I think much of what's happening with self-tracking devices uh, and the whole kind of paraphernalia of, of these technologies is that they function according to an economy of hope. And this economy of hope actually works by promising reward. If you, if you do 10,000 steps, you're going to lead a healthier life. If you eat this kind of food, you're going to lose weight. And so, th so there is an economy of hope that is at the heart of this, of this uh, technologies, without which they wouldn't be that popular. So I think industry has always been very good at capitalizing on people's anxieties, wishes, fears, dreams, and that's how it has always been, and it continues to be. If I can add one thing, maybe you can look at it more broadly as a, a more contemporary development of the practices of care of the self, right? So in a faculty mm -hmm. sense, there is never a, a finishing, there is never a point when you reach sanctity after confession, right? So you can, the, the, the promise of uh, finally achieving that goal is always kind of <coughs> postponed, but it's a, it's a thorn in flesh, so it, it's a, it, it kind of pushes you to, to continue to, to, to be always vigilant and to always uh, uh, care, take care of yourself. Only in this in this circumstance, we are talking about a, a quantified version of, of that uh, of that practice. Absolutely. Many questions. <coughs> Hi. Um, maybe it relates to the both previous questions, but uh, I, I I want to uh, ask the panel in general, if you think that there is a relationship, uh, a relation of, of, of any kind in terms of history, because uh, uh, as you, uh, the medium of games specifically, I'm thinking specifically about video games, but the gaming in general as it sort of uh, became like a cultural phenomena that was eventually an industry and now is some sort of multi-million dollar industry and so on. Uh, Many of its codes have now become canon, and many of the they have become stable now, uh, as it's sort of after, as the medium came into into sort of the mainstream. And I wonder if you think uh, maybe a way to offer an explanation as to why now, why is it that gamification mm -hmm. is happening now, has maybe something to do with history as well, with the fact that uh, many of the ways in which enjoy, in which we enjoy these games have become more stable now, and hence corporations and, 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 uh, and, and so on have been able to reverse engineer this enjoyment. Uh, and so, so it is the case that now it is relatively easier for them to understand how, how, you know, what makes us tick in terms of games. Whereas before it seemed like, uh, specifically, I'm, I'm thinking um, sort of in the very beginning of, of, of video games, every, it seemed to me like games were all, every possible game you know, everything was possible in terms of gaming, and you found these very weird, strange games that you didn't really know how to enjoy and that you had to learn how to enjoy. Uh, whereas it, it seems to me that that's, that's not the case anymore. Uh, maybe, maybe going back to what Maria was, was saying, uh, a way of, of resisting gamification may also be, you know, to, to sort of unlearn many of the ways in which we have enjoyed games in the past. Mm -hmm. I do not necessarily concur with the fact that this is a, it's a matter of promise. Uh, 
I do think many of these, game, specifically in terms of gamification, many of these things are actually Skinner boxes. And they tend to uh, appeal to our innermost neurological impulses <laughs> rather than, than what we understand as, as a game as a whole, which is, I think, uh, also something that was. But I wonder if you, if you can comment on, on any of these points. I'm, I'm coming from a theatre background, so my comment would be kind of uh, um, not, uh, perhaps a bit indirect, but um, certainly um, I, I'm sure you're right that the, the genre of games has matured, has come to a maturity that allows for various exploitations of, of games and gaming practices. But it's interesting to note that Blast Theory have been using gaming structures in their work for a very long time. And the reason they do that is because they want, they think that this is a way to make their work more accessible to a wider demographic. So I think there's also this um, um, notion that games um, and gaming practices are um, participative and are thus um, kind of um, make, make things accessible, are in, 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 um, uh, what's the word, are, are appealing and seductive um, to start with. So they uh, can attract people in, in, in a way that other cultural forms perhaps mm -hmm. can't. They're more difficult to access. So that would be where mm -hmm. I'd come from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any more comments on that question? Uh, maybe just a, a quick one. Uh, there are also other comments at the moment in, in game studies about, for example, what if uh, are mo most mobile games really games, considering that they work on a very similar model where we are kind of uh, uh, encouraged to obsessively um, click and, and push the, the screen and, at, at every notification, but there are no real meaningful choices to make in those games, mm -hmm. and there is no finishing line again. So it's, it's a similar model. Uh, that has been studied to, to, that maybe creates a comparison between these examples that we've been talking about today and other forms of games that are officially classified as games, but are kind of borderline, if you like. Okay, we're gonna take two more questions and then we can continue with the glass of wine. Uh, so uh, here, okay, we'll, we'll take this two here. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I want to know how you break out, you broke away from that game. Oh, okay. Um, Any withdrawal symptoms? Yeah. 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 No, no, no. Um, no, actually, one of the, the things I kind of realized at one point that there is never a good reason to stop using these things, right? So you kind of need to make one, and uh, you need to you need to invent a good reason to say, okay, now this is the, the last day. And I've been reading many accounts of people who stop using uh, self-tracking devices and gadgets, and the, the, the reason is always external. It's always something happens and then you realize, okay, I'm gonna stop now. I'm gonna use this as an excuse to stop using the, the gadget. But you can always keep going for one more day, right? Okay. Uh, so you kind of need to make up an excuse. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. And I also want to know, um, out of the entire presentation during the course, I didn't hear you talk about maybe at the ethics of these game houses or these developers. What exactly, what, what are the ethics? Now, I don't know either. Um, if they, it is ethical for them to actually um, gather information about um, users, if it is not, you know, mm -hmm. what controls their development? That's what I get to know. Mm -hmm. Because assuming there is something that controls their development, uh, that uh, stops them from, or you know, disallow them from gathering information about the users and using it for certain purposes, that should be part of their ethics. Mm -hmm. That guarantees the users of the games that look, I know I can use this game without having any problem. Mm. Yeah. Well, it is part of, for example, the regulatory framework because there is data protection. Um, a lot of protection regulation that that and so it's, it goes really into like regulatory frameworks more than ethics. Although, especially for um, as far as I know, for example, for mobile health, there are also code of conducts that are more of ethical conducts that are being developed. But again, it's a, it's a field um, that is very um, and, and again I, I can speak more from from the mobile health perspective, but it's a field that it's very fluid at the moment, mm -hmm. and specific regulation is missing, although there are some regulatory frameworks that apply, for example, data protection. I mean, people are starting to talk about privacy by design, 
yeah. is that you implement uh, like products that are already embedded within them. There is a, an element of privacy and not think about privacy once you've already built, implemented, and marketed the product, but have it as something that goes hand in hand with the production process. But obviously ethics and the law are not the same thing, not the same thing at all. And I think for me, the ethical question is that it has so much to do with the assumptions that developers are making about health, what is healthy. It's like this 10,000 steps, where does it come from? I mean, we know the origin. It's a Japanese study in, uh, in the 1960s that suggested walking 10,000 steps is the ideal number for keeping a healthy heart and so on. But then this making these assumptions, all the five vegetable, vegetables and fruits a day, so all these things that, that actually implemented and designed into the product, but without any kind of questioning or any uh, reconsideration, maybe things have changed and we need to move from the 10,000 steps to something else. Um, so yeah. I think the, the assumption nowadays is that if you have a problem with surveillance, it's because you have something to hide. Mm. Um. Yeah, and what, what uh, Snowden replies to that, he, he says, if you, you think that uh, uh, you don't care about privacy because you have nothing to hide, it's same as saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. yeah. Can I also briefly respond to say that um, actually for blast theory, a big issue was um, terms and conditions. And the I know it's very boring, but it's about the transparency of that and how accessible it is to users. So there are, though, you know, there is a, 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 a regulatory frameworks and, and there's legislation. There is a, a big issue with how aware users are about how uh, <coughs> companies, um, what kind of data they access, how they collect the data, how they use the data. And very often users don't give permission for the data to be exploited in certain ways uh, which it is being um, exploited through. Um, and so kind of I've got just um, um, here um, a comment saying that the research by um, investment specialist Scandia um, suggests that only 7% of people read the, the terms and conditions online yeah. when signing up for products and services. And that's because people think they're boring or very difficult to understand. And there's also a very um, a, um, research, a research from the University of Nottingham that concluded, you might have heard of that, that Google's terms and conditions are less readable than the epic or old English poem Beowulf. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not sure how to yeah. pronounce that because I've never read this poem. But that kind of, I think for me, that is a, a really big issue. Yes. And that's the issue that kind of last year we're also trying to address mm. in Karen as well. Mm -hmm. And also, for instance, when you look at the terms and conditions about privacy uh, when it comes to Fitbit, if you read it, it says, we will never share your data except when it is necessary to do so. <laughs> but then, what is, when is it necessary? And they, they give no explanation or as to what context it would be deemed necessary to share the data. So it's so vague. And I think they play with that vagueness. And they play with the fact that we hardly take the time to read the terms and conditions. Two years ago, I co-developed with Headlong Theater uh, an app called the Digital Double. And basically, we tried to play with this notion of uh, like terms and condition. Uh, it was in relation to uh, the play 1984, and we developed this app for all the people who purchased uh, a ticket. They can actually download it on their phone, and um, if they click terms and condition, they're immediately giving us access to uh, uh, to their data and to be able to scrape data from the internet about them. Um, and yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is that we got a lot of people ticking the box without even reading the, the statements at all. But even more alarm, alarmingly, uh, we kind of uh, had the, in the theater foyer, in some of the theaters where the, the 1984 was playing, we projected back at them their digital double, like how they look like online when you take all the summary of all that data and project it onto them. Instead of having an element of surprise or shock or anger, what we got is like, oh, look at me, I'm, on, I'm in the theater for you, oh, that's me. So there was an element of we're holy in fame, if only for a few seconds. And that, that was seductive and that was very enjoyable for people. So I was like really taken back by that. I thought we were going to get like complaints and people would be shocked. How dare you kind of do this to my uh, data online? But people were very happy with that. And they were very like, oh, cool. So, yeah. <laughs> 
one last question from this yes, gentleman. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask about uh, quantification in general and uh, kind of touching on what you spoke predominantly about, um, you know, your breakup with a particular piece of technology and the advert uh, on Nike Fuel, you look at that and then of course you see the marketing shortcut that life equals, uh, sorry, movement equals life and of course they mean physical mm -hmm. movement and, you know, cause that, that is just physical movement, nothing else. There's so many other things and so, uh, but coupled with that, uh, I think it'd be too simple just to call it a marketing. It is coupled with uh, uh, a huge unjustified uh, techno hyper optimism. Uh, mm -hmm. And I wonder what you have to say. I, I don't think that we spoke much about that this evening, but about the generally limits of quantification and how somehow this can be uh, in the public discourse, how this can be meaningfully uh, balanced, because of course we don't quite know what those what those limitations are, and we keep pushing the frontier. But uh, mm -hmm. as many philosophers have uh, uh, said, you know, by by uh, sort of casting questions in the um, casting questions, expecting mm -hmm. numerical results, you start shifting the questions. You sh you start shifting the theme in a way that you you leave out the unquantifiable bits and you can only leave out the quantifiable bits and how can this be, you know, what steps can be taken maybe in this, in this area? Mm, absolutely. I mean, people are talking now about the second degree meaning in the quantified self because they're realizing exactly what you've just said, that um, um, to reduce the experience of self-tracking to numerical data and algorithms is no longer enough. You need to make sense of that data so they are moving to the second order of meaning, whereby uh, interpretation, analysis, subjectivity come, comes to play. Uh, but the problem is that even with the what we can call the qualified self, as opposed to the quantified self, it is still confined to certain ways about thinking about what does it mean to be healthy, uh, what needs to be tracked, and what's the, the, the ultimate goal of that tracking. So it is still kind of limited by certain boundaries of thinking. So maybe it's the, the, the challenge is to actually ask questions that can take us even beyond that second order of meaning to something completely different, to different forms of engagement as such. And maybe you have other reflections uh, yeah, on that. Yeah, well, it's, it's a, of course a very, very broad question. And um, I, I think more, more generally what, what we are seeing now is a I think it's it's also kind of difficult to answer because it kind of maybe assumes that there is one <coughs> one agenda, one kind of um, uh, you know one reason why uh, quanti quantified self movement movement is happening now. Uh, and there are of course are many different reasons, many different agendas, many uh, also contradictory standpoints. Um, and the marketing talk talk is also very often contradictory with itself. I think what, what what we are experiencing now is probably which is probably one of the most interesting things is that we are getting accustomed to this. We are getting into the habit, of, and the norm, there is also a normalization of self-tracking, uh, so that nowadays we kind of take it for, for granted that our phone is probably also counting our steps. We actually would be surprised if it doesn't. Um, so there is, uh, there is this normalization of, of self-tracking, self uh, which of course is also potentially dangerous, if you like, because then the consequence of that would be, well, if Apple is counting my steps, why, why, is, why my government is not doing it? Right? So that this sort of reasoning is kind of appearing more and more. Um, and then what sorts of areas are quantified and what are not? Um, well, yeah, that's, that, that's of course open to, to question. What can be quantified, what cannot be quantified? Does it matter if something cannot be quantified? Does it still matter? I don't know. Yeah. Okay, well, we end here. Thank you so much for... <laughs> Thank you.